I'm going to start off with one of the analog horror video that I want to go over and kind of talk about analog horror versus ARGs, what's the differences, and like what are some good ones in case like you're actually into that kind of stuff. Jim and I talked a little bit about this as far as like what's really good analog horror. Well, the both of us came up with the list. So analog horror. Analog horror is stylized to look like um, like VHS style or retro games and stuff like that. It's kind of got an old retro vibe to it of some extent, right? Where ARGs stand for Augmented Reality Game. And it basically is something that, on top of being a video or a video series sometimes, is also a puzzle of sorts, usually. So, like, these will have websites attached to them. Some of them are really, like, in-depth. Like, you've got to actually take and run codes. And sometimes these codes are hex codes where they lead to images. Sometimes they'll lead to images that lead to QR codes that lead to something totally fucking else. You're doing inspect elements on stuff. You're watching the captions for clues and things because that's how deep this goes. So, a, so to give you an idea, like, analog horror, okay? <laughs> So good analog horrors of note would be like Backrooms, Local 58, Winter of 83, Greylock, Lake City Quiet Pills, Lois is Missing, Limiting Land, Marvel Hornets, The Walden Tapes, which ties into the FNAF stuff, Gemini Home Entertainment, Mandela Catalog, Monument Mythos, Smile Tapes, uh, Midwest Angelica, Tangy Virus, uh, Ben's Drowned Pet Stop, Seminium Dream Viewer, Corner Folk, Vanita Carnis, Oracle Project. I really, really, really love Oracle Project. Uh... Angel Hair, uh, Children Under the House, extremely creepy, White Stag edu Education, The Oldest View, which is the newest Ken Pixels thing, Ken Pixels is the guy that came up with the back rooms, and then ARGs. ARGs, we didn't come up with a whole lot because they're harder to find because they take so much more effort. So ARGs are more mystery flesh pit. Uh, this house has people in it. Uh, the sun has vanished. Cicada 3301, Welcome Home. Hypnagogic Archive. Um, Shipwreck 64, MyHouse.Wad. And I know that Jim came up with another one here, and I'm trying to find it. Not plus ten. Yes, I just found it. The I Love Bees campaign from Halo Two. Oh yeah, yeah, that is that is actually an ARG. Yeah, I still remember the first one being the Blair Witch. I mean, I I honestly would say the Blair Witch is an ARG because there was so much lore that came out with that that they promoted it. It looked real, and you gotta remember this is super early, like Internet 1.0 days, and like <laughs> like 56k modems and stuff like that. Like all the noises when you start up and everything. Yeah. Yeah, like, this this was their thing back in the day. So you're getting on these websites and stuff, and, like, it looks real. And there was no, like, way to, like, say, you could debug debunk this, like, now. Like, it's so early. It was so wild, wild west back then. It, everything was real. But, like, yeah, there's just, there's so many freaking things. Um, unedited footage of bears, one I associated with Wham City. Not that this house has people in it, because, like, I didn't even think about that. You're right. That is... Uh, Wham City Comedy, but yes, it, it, I don't know, that was a really cool one because there were so many levels that, like the security passwords and stuff, to get into a legit looking like login screen, and then like from the login screen, like then it took you to file logs and all sorts of other stuff, and like you had to have a good sense about how to operate maybe a backside of like, like a file explorer, yeah, yeah, like a terminal, yeah, yeah, there's CD for change directories and stuff like that, and yeah, like terminal commands. And, like, just knowing what to do, like, list, uh, I, which is funny because I actually, I'm old school enough. I actually still do all of my, uh, my disk commands, like, when I do disk partitions and all that stuff, through the actual command prompt. So, there's a fantastic thing that I found. Nightmind actually has the Nightmind index, where he has all of this stuff listed out. Like, he has obscure ones that I've never even heard of. And it's all viewer uh, contribution. So, it's, like, an ongoing list of viewer contribution of, like what they are, where they're found, what type of they are, whether they're analog horror or ARG and everything. Yeah, I just found this looking for, uh, looking for ones that, like, trying to remember. Yeah, Nightmind Index. So if you just search that, it's an unfiction index. And it's, like, it's got full rules for submissions and everything. But, like, I can go to horror and, like, it'll literally just list out one after another, if it ever goes there. Like, some of these obscure ones, like, there's White Stag Education. But, like... Uh, creature collection. I mean, I went through 10 pages of this trying to, like, remind myself of different ones. But, like, yeah, and they're all sorted, like, tags. Horror, ARG, uh, multi-platform, found footage with beavers. Angel Hair is actually heavy heavy in theology. Yeah, Wendigoon's gone over it. I watch a lot from Nightmind and Cro-Mudgeon. cro, -Mudgeon. cro -Mudgeon, I love, as an up-and-coming, like, horror guy, cro has got some pretty cool stuff going on. And, like, uh, he's actually got uh, a really recent video on like how to be scary 
and like which applies it applies to the video that we're going to go over by the way if i can recommend a video for anybody that like wants to check out chromogen and why i like him so much either uh the myhouse.wad one which is the doom mod or liminal land which is this one both are great because he does it with such a style that nobody else has done he pretends like he's talking and interviewing somebody else and actually going through this stuff and so like he's talking to like the, a, a visitor or a computer or the audience uh semi-indirectly it really kind of reminds me of um i kind of like how he almost like role plays it like he's like documenting it like he's like in the universe that the actual topic is in you know what i mean kind of like how like you see like the scp thing it's always like written as like oh you're there cataloging it it's not something that's just exists by the way i had you muted nobody can hear oh. you on screen oh damn it it's okay it's the first time for me typically you're just muted to me and i can't hear you <laughs> Was that muted the whole time? <laughs> yeah. So you were you were literally having a schizophrenic conversation. Yes, but I I repeat a lot of things. So <laughs> that's, well, that's good. Um, like people heard the knock ten thing because of repeated the knock ten thing, but they didn't hear any of the other stuff. <laughs> oh wow! Damn. Okay. Hi everybody. Welcome to Strictly Patrick. It's Saturday night. <laughs> yeah, one day we'll get it. <laughs> It'll be flawless. I promise. Eventually. Anyway. Anyway. Urban spook. Urban spook. We've got. So this is this is a really disliked analog horror, and it's you you might see why. It's it's because it tries to be too much, and like keep that in mind. Like, but another thing too that I don't know if he goes into it because I haven't seen this video okay. is just how bad he is as a person. Um, like I stopped watching when I got a pretty good gist of how he carried out this video. I liked how he did the video. He did an honest review at first, like the first ha uh, rough half of this third is going to be going over the whole series up to this point. And this point is pretty new. This was five months ago. Okay. So it's relatively new. Um, I don't know if there's been more episodes. I really don't care. Yeah. Well, I know <laughs> some of the biggest issues with him too is like, I think it was actually Pro that did it, that criticized him. And because he was a small channel, sort of like went after him and sort of like sicked his fan base on him. And then there was like, um, people like he was like bashing them like oh yeah for a profile picture you, you you degenerate kill yourself okay. stuff like that and then when Dugoon comes out makes the same criticisms that i think crow made and he's like <laughs> oh yeah no totally oh, i, oh, I sir, totally yes, see sir, what you're yes, saying sir, please yeah, sir, because me... when has millions, right? so it's like that sort of like you don't care about the actual criticism but th the clout you can get from it okay so urban spook is shit horror okay next subject <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah like and, and when we say shit horror it's really bad like this person they were found dead and they were stabbed in the vagina 9842 times and then they were decapitated and then they had sex with the head and then they put the head on a stick uh, okay sorry teddy <laughs> like <laughs> when we get on one we get on one <laughs> like literally like patrick can attest to it that's literally how the horror is it's like just diatribes of like gross yeah. stuff yeah, so this one's great, because if you know nothing about this, Gigi, he goes over the full series. Mm, okay. So, this actually does work. Earlier, there's a subgenre of horror content on YouTube known as mm -hmm. analog horror, which is horror content that aims at the aesthetic that the analog technology creates, such as that made by the EHS teams. We started a strategy to capture the uncanny feeling during an old broadcast or an emergency alert turned into a popular genre, which would be what some consider its undoing. One of the most commonly cited examples of this degradation is a series on the YouTube channel Urban Spook called The Painter. The series is awful, as we'll go over, but the creator is also delusionally defensive of his slot. But even that's ambiguous. It's only part of why people make fun of Urban Spook, the worst YouTube horror series. To criticize the series, it is essential that we not only know the series, but also what it's all trying to get at. The first episode of the painter titled Faces starts the series off by introducing the simple premise. So he's going to do a lot of art that's like kind of Mandela catalog-ish, but like also falls into that... that scary stories to tell in the dark kind of like vibe too if you again like we were talking about like if you remember the book or any of that or even the movie because they did actually do a fantastic job of translating the characters into the movie a serial killer is at large and he makes paintings detailing the methods which he kills his victims the episode starts when the police find three paintings in a storage unit wait a minute i got a quick question here yeah when was this channel made and when did he start producing content urban spook i'd have to look because i have an interesting theory because if it comes out after, like, 2016, I might know where he oh, got his idea from. It's oh, it definitely, definitely was. Newer. It's, it's, like, in the last couple of years. Like, it was getting big around Greylock, which I think was, like, two years ago or a year ago. So the very first video was November 3rd, 2022. 
Okay, so I kind of want to say that he got inspired by like this side quest in Fallout 4, where there's actually a serial killer who makes paintings of his victims. And it's it's in you know like the uh, setting of Fallout 4. It's basically in the uh, good uh, good neighbor area of the map if you're playing oh, the okay. game. Oh, okay. And basically, uh, one of the characters you could have as a companion, while he's the mayor of Good Neighbor, gives you the task of finding out uh, who the serial killer is because he's just killing raiders in the game. However, he uses their blood to do paintings and whatnot. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah so I'm wondering if he got like kind of inspired by that after playing Could and then be. created this channel. Could be. I wouldn't be surprised because I know Wendigoon, when he covered it, said that he saw an interview with Urban Spooks and he basically admitted that he just made the series to basically be a signal boost for his art. Oh, really? So, yeah, so I can see him doing that just uh, to sort of bring more attention to it. Okay, because if I remember correctly, the serial killer in that side mission is called the Pikmin. Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, I, I was wondering, because, I don't know, it just, like, the way how you described it, it reminded me of that. So I'm wondering if that's, like, the inspiration for this shit. It wouldn't surprise me. Like, no, it wouldn't, now that I think of some of it, yeah. Murders. The first victim, Carla, was found with 36 stab wounds and had all her teeth removed. Her painting titled Carla's Teeth, showing a character with exaggerated teeth. It's symbolic in a way. The second victim, Jackie, was stabbed 27 times in the taint, living through the stabbing, but ultimately dying to being drowned. Her painting titled Floating Jackie is a, a, you know, a body in red water. It's less symbolic and a little more literal than the last one. The final victim victim of this episode is James, whose face was pulled off and his wrist slit open. His painting was titled James' Secret Face, and it entails a dude just pulling his face off. The episode continues by showing other paintings that haven't been connected to other murders yet. These being Wax Doll Tom, Lisa's Secret Face, Hanging Jimmy, Fuck Toy Cory, Daniel After the Fire, Jennifer's Last Air, Scream Maggie Scream. We then Hold get up. shown photos of Jimmy. Fuck Toy Cory? No, it's as bad as you think. It is literally about as cool as all the child. And that got a lot of people pissed off with him. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. James, Jackie, and a Jimmy, who we have a painting of, but police haven't found. The episode ends with a painting called Self-Portrait, which represents the killer. Here we can already see some of the problems with the series. The series claims to be that of a police investigation, and the tapes appear to be made by the police department, so what I'm really wondering is, where is any of the insight into the investigation? So first off, the bat. For an analog horror to start out, lay out all this art of people that have died, with ridiculous fucking stories tied to them. And then, oh, here's the killer. It kind of already immediately takes away from the horror for it. Like, you can have good horror and never see anything. Like, I think of, again, going, like, Winter 83 has a fantastic killer in that horror. And it's not what you expect. And, like, you know, uh, what is it? Is it, uh, it's Mandela Catalog, the one with the, the clones that I'm thinking of? The alternates, yeah. The alternates, yeah. So, like, yeah. There's, there's even that where it's like, uh, you know, you know, pretty early in the story about alternates, but it doesn't ruin the story. This just is so that it's awful. Well, I mean, given the picture of the of the killer, it just looks like a bloodshot gooner. Yeah. Well, it, there's like... there's there's a whole lot of tell there once you hear about like some of these stories. Oh my God. They only get a lot more ridiculous. Yeah, like like I said, fuck toy Corey was literally about like the sexual assault of a child. And what? when he was confronted about it, he was so cavalier about it. That's when a lot of people started hating him. Okay, so basically he's like the Shad Man, but as Dick Masterson. Yeah, trying to just be edgy and basically like, I'm going to create the most goriest, edgiest thing ever. And then I'm going to cry when people say my, my stuff isn't good. Yeah. And like, there's such a, such a level of like, I don't, I don't even know, like distastefulness to it. Like, at one, or, like, unbelievableness. Like, yeah, a lot of these stories, like, have an unbelievable factor to them. But, like, he talks about one point somebody being stabbed 400 and something times. Yeah. That's why I made the joke about, like, you know, 4,942 stabs to the vagina. Yeah. Because it's, like, just so incredibly over the top. And he even sold the Fuck Toy Cory art on a t-shirt. Oh, so, wow. like, you're selling a t-shirt where you're literally playing light and fast and loose with the idea of, of sexually assaulting a minor. Like Yeah, there's unnecessary, like, there's un unnecessary uh, child gore. Unnecessary animal gore, um, unnecessary zoophilia, unnecessary fucking gore in general <laughs> that that is in this story. Like, so basically, he's Vito making the uh, super killer comic. Yes. Yeah, he's, he's like a mix of Vito <laughs> and Shadman trying to make a horror. We get descriptions of how these victims died, and we get to see these spooky paintings, but we don't get much detailing of the actual police activity. 
since this is the first episode though it could just be a case of first episode syndrome where the first episode is just kind of mid compared to the rest of us but let's see if that gets any better episode two named the lighthouse starts off in the deep talking about the police officer named bill collins who found the self-portrait from episode one in his own house him and his family have gone missing and in searching for him they found his two-month-old daughter hanging in the attic her painting was titled long-necked angel and it was found in the family car just found on the ocean side i guess Police eventually took their search to a lighthouse, which was out of commission, finding a painting on the door. Inside, they found the burnt corpse of a teen named Daniel, which gives us a connection to Daniel after the fire. Venturing further into the tunnels under the lighthouse, finding the corpses of Jennifer and Lisa White, who are represented by a couple of previous paintings from the last episode. Police end up finding a barrel filled with meat and bones, who are made of the rest of the Collins family. Photos were apparently taken of the family before death, and they're shown right here. A fourth photo is shown, which bears striking resemblance to the self-portrait. If you've heard of this series, you've almost certainly heard about this episode. Episode 3 titled In the Walls details the disappearance of two 11-year-old twins, Corey and Margaret Beck, and how five days after their disappearance they were found inside an abandoned factory. Despite being considered found, only the top half of Margaret and the bottom half of Corey were found. The halves were stitched together when their respective other halves have yet to be found. Margaret's neck and jaw were broken with a brick being shoved down her throat. The brick had the word meat written on it. Corey's cock and balls were pulled off his body by force. In case you haven't made the connection, these two paintings are Fuck Toy Corey and Scream Maggie Scream. A week before Corey's disappearance, he had been dared to go into a spooky cabin and was met by a face. He took photos of the inside of the cabin and were shown the photos. The last one seeming to be the picture from the self-portrait. I skipped talking about episode 2 in depth so that I could use them both to just talk about the main grievance with this series that I'm sure you can understand at this point. The series hasn't really learned from its first episode and still doesn't really give any insight into what the police are doing, and instead just wants to talk about all the gruesome murders that took place. It's not an unpopular opinion to find the series not scary at all, and there's a point at which something is so shocking that it actually just isn't even scary anymore. If anything, it's actually kind of funny. Fuck Toy Cory has actually just become an in-joke with my friends and I because of just how goofy it is. If Urban Spook wanted to make a horror series so shocking it just ends up being funny, then he really hit the spot. But something tells me that wasn't really his goal and I'll get to that later. Another nitpick I have with the story is what it shows as photographs. The photos that Corey Beck took are clearly like real photographs, and then you compare that to the photos that are just found of people before death. And you know, that ruins immersion for me. You know, fuck Toy Corey, I can stay immersed in that. Episode 4, The Clue, tells us that an investigator named Sean went missing, and the last body he found before his disappearance was that of a Tom Harris. It was found that the killer climbed up Tom's drain pipe and went into his bedroom window. A pile of wax was found in the living room, and inside was the body of Tom, who had died of suffocation from the wax. We can't just have him suffocate from the wax, though. His arms and eyelids were cut off, and for some reason there's a third arm in the pile of wax with an unknown owner. The painting Wax Doll Tom from episode 1 gets solved, leaving us with only hanging Jimmy. Back to the investigator Sean, though. He went missing, and the police found Sean's dog in his apartment with all her legs broken, but you know, yeah, so this is the mildest of things that you're going to hear involving animals. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, granted, it, there are so many fucking series that do this type of horror way better. <laughs> like, In fact, Greylock has a fucking um, body horror scene with animals that actually yeah. is terrifyingly well done. Yes. As opposed to like this just, it's crass for the sake of being crass, right? Like, Yeah. Like, I just, I'm trying to think, like, there's so many, like better versions of this same style like the ruining of immersion is a big one especially for like people that genuinely like horror like when when you go from a fantastical picture to like these these ultra realistic pictures and then like i'm supposed to believe this is all part of an actual thing like it's just so fucking fantastical that it's just awful yeah and another hard thing to do is like when like the storyline it's like this dude is just a, a mary sue of murder yeah. Like, he just happens to be believed. It's like, he walked through the wall, and then he ripped her head off, and then he shut down her throat, and then he he lifted <laughs> her body up and tore it into 14 pieces, and then he bathed in the blood, and we found a picture of her naked. Like, what, what what's the what's the point? Like, this dude can do everything. He's, like... It, he's, it's to the point of, like, parody, almost. He's a Doctor like, Doom of serial killer. killers, you know? <laughs> well, it's like, they, it's like they took, like, I want the overpowered Jason Voorhees, but I want to make him an edgy art kid. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like... Yeah. I don't know. Like it's like an edge lord. It's like if fucking <laughs> Freddy Krueger or like Jason was bullied in high school and he turned to art therapy and then just snapped. <laughs> right? Like that's just all I get from this. Use the art. Use the machete as an extension of your arm, Jason. <laughs> Remember, flesh can be a canvas too, Jason. <laughs> she was still alive. Blood was found trailing to the kitchen. The only clue police found being the number two, written in blood by Sean. A new painting named The Man in the Pipes was found in Sean's bedroom. Security footage managed to snap a picture of the killer. 
and this is it. The next installment witness is more of the same. A girl named Tina and her sister Flora are taken on hey, a road real trip. Quick. Yeah. Do you see Slug and Chad anywhere? Uh, yeah, up higher. Uh, just below oh. Teddy's last message, he basically just said that he left the server, nothing personal, and he's restructuring. Okay, because I can't see him in chat anywhere. What the fuck? <laughs> Did he block <laughs> you for making a joke? I don't know. Or maybe I blocked him, I forget which. I, oh. <laughs> I, I just, I see Belinda adding him, I'm like, where the fuck is he at? Oh. I don't know. I was having a more funny headcanon, I guess, than reality. <laughs> <laughs> by Tina's boyfriend Jack. Wouldn't you know it, they go missing and Jack's car is found with a painting in it titled Flower Face Flora, obviously alluding to Tina's sister. Tina's found alive, but her arms and feet are cut off. Flora, however, was found with her head smashed by a hammer. This is fine for police to show, I guess, because, you know, there it is. Tina says the killer is still near, and though police can't find him, another painting is found titled The Long Jack, which- Can we just talk about the, the fantastical fact of, like, the, the police find that he's still near, but he's had time to set up an easel and do these fucking paintings. Of these murders, law committed in these murders. In modern these, day time with CCTV everywhere. These long like, drawn out process <laughs> murders. <laughs> with like like CCTV and all these surveillance systems in modern yeah. day times. Yes. Like it, that's what I'm saying. It's like it, he's like the Mary Sue of murder. Yeah. Like it's just like <laughs> it's like he just is this perfect like He cannot be caught. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like he's the Ray Skywalker of murder. Right? <laughs> like someone like fucking hired Disney to write to write <laughs> write analog horror. Yeah, like it's, it's just it, it. As you can tell, there's a lot that frustrates us with this type of stuff. Yeah, Wendigoon was far nicer than I think he deserved. Been. Yeah, because like he was like, I can see that there's merit here and stuff like that. And like, yeah, no, I agree with you, Isaiah. But like, he, he I can't even see. I can't even like. I cannot see any merit here. Well, I mean, like he he knows how to do the good voice acting, right? Like he got good voice actors. That was it. If for he me. if he just reined in the 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 insane uh, over the topness and just added that hint of more realism, like you know they found her with her throat cut, and then it's like you know a picture of her with a maybe a, a smile in her throat rather than her face. Yeah. Cool. Then I'm there because that adds like that chilling like. killing them in a fire like with wax and it's like yeah well like the the unnecessary the unnecessities of it like the unnecessariness i don't know how to call it but like like the stuff that you're gonna hear with the fetus in a bit the stuff you'll hear with the horse the breaking of the dog's legs like why just because like animal cruelty cool like is that what we're going with here yeah, it's like, oh, you like your pet? Well, what if I did this to your pet? You should. Like it's so you're shocking. Really scared, right? You drowned like, the goldfish. Like, <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, that's and that's what it comes off. It comes off as very sort of like he not even the wings off of the fly. <laughs> like that's what yeah, it comes it off comes to me. Across as I, childish, but not in like in the sense of like this is like what you what you would say to like when you're trying to scare a kid. Yeah. Where you just throw a bunch of really scary stuff with a big number of like this is what happened. Yeah, and then the kid like can't quantify it, so it just seems like terrifying. Where like as an adult, you can sort of be like, "Oh, well, it just takes me out of it because it's so unrealistic." Yeah, it's just it, the, it's so fantastical, and it just bothers me. It's frustrating. Should just been put in Jack's car while the police were away. Jack's still not found. We get a sketch of the killer's face, which just about lines up with everything we've seen thus far. Okay, this one's a little wild. Episode six, Pig starts off by telling us that a four. This is where it kind of gets into a lot of, like, way over-the-top shit. Just so you guys know. Like, there's going to be bestiality and all sorts of animal cruelty and everything coming up. Just, just a full war. Former police officer named Ian Ford and his wife May have gone missing. Police find May at a bar in handcuffs. What the hell is that? What the hell just happened? Are you okay? I heard a, I heard a mysterious call. And I don't know where May it came from. Maybe it's the painter. He's coming for revenge. You dare, speak as Ill of, you dare speak as ill of his content. He's now come to claim his rightful place. <laughs> Though her hands had been ripped off her body and was found badly mangled, but autopsy showed she was dead from internal bleeding. A dead horse was found in the barn from a Sildenafil overdose. Sildenafil, for those who don't know, that's Viagra. The head of the Ford's granddaughter was found, and it's shown right here. In other stall of the barn, faces were nailed to the walls, some belonging to previous victims. Also, there were some decapitated pigs, but in the middle of this stall was a giant pig that was sliced open and stitched back together. Inside the pig was Ian Ford's body, and inside the pig's eye sockets were the eyes of Fiona Ford, the granddaughter. In the tack room, the rest of Fiona's body was found along with some paintings. We got shown the painting Breeding Mount May, which is meant to represent May Ford. In case the dead horse from a Viagra overdose and May's death being from internal bleeding wasn't enough, 
it's now capital C clear that she was fucked to death by this horse. <laughs> Ian the pig has a double meaning because Ian Ford was, was a cop, by Bosch. but also because he was stuck inside a pig after his death. Four Holes Fiona is just a painting of Fiona's head with her eyes coming out. Here's hoping Four Holes doesn't refer to any Funk Toy Cory type activities, but with this series it almost definitely is. Other paintings we get are Wet Skin George, The Jigsaw Baby, Little Hole Isabel, Hide and Zeke, Breathless Janice, Fleshhead Fred, Teen of the Witness, and Observing Paul. Teen of the Witness we can already connect to the last episode. A tape is also found that's heavily damaged, but miraculously the footage gets to be recovered, which is the footage you're seeing right now. And if that doesn't ruin it for you, the rest of this series will. Episode 7, Family, opens with some more murders. The first victim shown is a teacher named Isabel, who called the police as she was attacked, but the address she gave them led police to a different scene. Police were led to a house belonging to a family of three people named Janice, Paul, and Zeke. The family was expecting another child in a few months. Janice and Paul, the husband and wife, were found executed in the kitchen with the fetus ripped out of Janice. Janice had been strangled with the umbilical cord. Paul was found dead. This is going to get more extreme. Again, this is, the whole thing with this guy is going to be extreme upon extreme upon extreme upon extreme. Shock and shock and shock and shock. But again, just warning. Tied to the kitchen counter a few feet from Janice. <laughs> The fetus had been spread around the house, and Paul was found to be dead of asphyxiation after the head of the unborn daughter was shoved down his throat. Zeke is missing, but you know, given the, the, the painting, hide and Zeke, it's, I'm sure you can guess. A painting was found in the house with the title mostly being scratched out except for Pipes. The Pipes painting is a little ambiguous at the moment as to who that is, though some theorize it's Sean from episode 4, because he's the man in the pipes and it kind of looks like him. Already we have four paintings from the last episode with Observing Paul, Breathless Janice, Hide and Zeke, and the Jigsaw Baby. Isabel Jackson from the beginning of the episode's house is tracked down. There they find the body of a Bruce Jackson stabbed seven times. And where one would expect to find his head, a painting lay in its stead. I guess that's the language police reports use now. The painting called Infinite Mob Bruce is shown and Isabel's found dead with a hole being drilled through her frontal lobe. A note was put inside of her blowhole, which, yeah, this murder is the painting uh, blowhole Isabel. The note says, I live where I can't breath, and I eat without teeth, what am I? Well, there are two answers to this riddle. One being a whale, because they can't breathe underwater, and they eat without teeth. They technically have baleen, uh, which could just be like a little, a little, a little cruel remark at Isabel. Uh, the other answer would be just a, a fetus, because they, they, you know, you, you can't breathe in the womb, and they don't eat with their teeth, so, you know, you can go with either one of those answers, but the important part is two sets of footprints were found at the scene, indicating more than one murderer which is what Sean's blood drawing from episode 4 was alluding to. The audio of Isabel's phone call is played, which is the first voice acting we've ever gotten in the series. This voice acting is actually good, but I just want to point something out. The fact that they sit there and they've only alluded to there's one killer, there's one killer, there's one killer, aside from Mysterious 2 written on the wall in blood, when there was multiple victims at that point, so there's nothing to lead you to think that there might be multiple killers up until they literally have to then shove it down your throat and say, there's two footprints, so there's two killers. But again, you've never ever seen the second killer, even when it came to CCT or CCTV footage, you only see the one. So miraculously, this other killer has av averted ever being recorded. God, I fucking hate stories like this. There's nothing, there's nothing tying it together. There's no good storytelling here. Phone call is played, which is the first voice acting we've ever gotten in the series. Now, if you are going to sell this story a different way, lead with this and a couple different audio recordings. Would have totally transformed this story. Versus yeah. the shitty artwork and the over-the-top gore and describing things that police wouldn't actually describe to the general public. Yeah, and what he could have done too is like with like the photograph, right? Yeah. He could have tied that in as like one does the pictures while maybe the other do does photography. Yeah. And that could have leaned into the whole like there's a second killer because like the MOs are the are, are the same with a different method. Yeah. But they didn't even lean into arms. that. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, it, you, so you can't even have, like, a John Kramer sort of, like, situation where it's, yeah, like, you know, this, here's, yeah, like, here's the pig, you know, and, yeah. like, here is John Kramer, you know, because they didn't even they didn't lead that up to you. It's, like, those mysteries or whatever, like, yeah. where you, like, watch it and they, like, almost challenge you to, and then the the main character pulls out a red herring that you've never seen on screen before. It's, like, well, I could have solved that, too, if I would have known that the guy was at the restaurant three days ago. By the but, way... Like, 
there's nothing leading to that evidence. No, and, and can I just say, like, another thing that bothers me, this is, like, being nitpicky, I can say, is, like, the CCTV, or, yeah, the CCTV footage. Um, it bothers me because you only have a still from the CCTV footage, and it's a fantastical still. It would have been better and scarier to have, like, a hooded figure and have the camera glitch more as, like, he looks up, and so you don't get a clear shot of the face, or it's distorted looking on the on the footage that they do get. Even as still, like, we took this still from the, from the CCTV footage, and this is what we got, and it's, like, a distorted version where you can just make out a mouth and eyes, but they're distorted looking, like, kind of Marble Hornets-esque. Yeah, where, like, maybe it, like, lends credence to, like, this is a supernatural <laughs> being. Yes. Right? And yes. you stage it like a Facebook post, like, everyone in this community, we're looking for this subject who did this... Yeah. At this time, please be aware of, of you know, this person in the area. Like, if you watch a lot of, like, EAS scenarios yeah. with, like, serial killers, that's how they stage it. Like, as a public service announcement, right? Yeah. That could have gone so much better in serving that point than just what we got. Yeah, or even, like, don't have, don't even have the police necessarily investigating this. This could be a fucking Reddit 4chan group type investigating this. Because that's happened so many times that they've investigated stuff like this, and then it's led to police investigation. You could bring in police stuff later on, but like you could then use all public access stuff, like oh, can we get the nine one one call or like you know uh, uh, police reports and stuff like that. It, you can do it and have it look more realistic than white text on black screen and such a short description that it doesn't it doesn't lend se credence to scene building. Because with all this stuff, you're doing it so lo fi that you have to be good at your writing. Yeah. Yeah, you have to kill it there. And if you don't kill it there, then you leave up all this, like, ambiguous bullshit like we are seeing, and it just doesn't land. Yeah. See, like, I, I was going to go... I was actually going to do an analog horror at one point. I was going to have it be on a uh, a removed-from-market prescription drug that was for schizophrenia. And I was going to have it be that, like, as as the person took it, their voices went away for them, but actually became audible for their family members. See, that's interesting, because that reminds me of an <laughs> EAS scenario that I once watched, where there was somebody that was on um, this medicine, and apparently this medicine caused a mutation and made people into zombies. So, like, that, that is a much more compelling story of, like, <laughs> whatever this medicine is, it's sort of causing a tulpa-like effect to manifest this yeah. person's inner delusions into reality. Kind yeah. of like a Greylock thing. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I was going to run with. And, like, I actually, I've got a video somewhere that I did on it. I didn't totally nuke it. <laughs> but, like, I made even, like, a short pharmacy commercial for the drug. I think I named it, like, Valerium or something like that. Like, something that sounds practical, uh, but kind of went on the side of, like, it looked like a real commercial, but, like, I had little glitch effects even and stuff. Like, if you pause at the right points, there was things, like, kind of almost, uh, I can't remember what series did it. Um, oh, oh, Channel 58. I took a little inspiration from Channel 58. I had quick one cell in the in the footage where if you paused it at the right time you would see like don't take it and like certain messages dropping in and like leading to like okay there's something wrong with this drug yeah because like um Greylock does that too yeah or the one episode with um jim's daughter right yep there's that like if you pause it at just that right second you see that little still frame of whoever that's sending him the tapes you're like where's your daughter jim yeah and then there was um i don't know if it was oracle project i think it might have been Oracle Project, or one of them, had even, like, a whole another story about, like, this alternate universe fairy tale where there's this giant, and he's this magical giant that lands on Earth, and it's, this whole thing is in single, single images within the story, and this fairy tale gets told over the whole episode, and if you don't pause and catch up, you would never know it's even there. It just looks glitched for a second. And in all of these glitches, there's this fairy tale about this king from another planet landing, and he's injured, and these people help nurse this giant to, to better health and all that. Um, but eventually people are like, oh, maybe we shouldn't like nurse him to health because he's so magical and powerful. Um, maybe we should be afraid of him. Let's lock him up here. And there's this small group of people that continue to nurse this, this magical giant, even though the other town folk don't know about it. And eventually he's awakened and ends up destroying the earth. And so um, it's, it's really interesting. Like you can do small things like that. Like you could even do like a gray lock here. And have this picture distort into the picture that they found. You could have a whole bunch of stuff happen that this guy just didn't do because shock. I want to shock people. Yeah, you can tell that, like like I said, like with that interview in retrospect, that's like the goal is to shock you and just to, to phrase his art. Like it, it's literally no, nothing more than like uh, signal boosting his art career. 
Yeah. And that's how the episode ends. Uh, it's probably a really cold take, but this is actually just the best moment of the series. All we've had thus far is just gory descriptions of murders of random people and sometimes some unsettling paintings. It was finally a breath of fresh air to hear more than just scary music play in the background and read white text on a screen. I think if the series leaned more into this aspect and actual showing without telling, then it could be improved a lot. At the time of making this video, there's only one episode left and it's titled Meat. A doctor named Fred is murdered in his own home, and neighbors heard a dog barking from his house, even though Fred only owned a cat. Police enter Fred's house and find evidence of a struggle in the kitchen and lots of Viagra. Fred had no skin on his head and the floor was riddled with sandpapers. Fred's cat couldn't be found, but a painting was found seemingly portraying the cat called Pocket Pussy. Fred's painting was found a while back with Flesh Out Fred, and we get the development that the painters are zoophiles too. Seems they skinned George and Shane Dawson his cat, but you know, that's pain <laughs> of mind I guess as we move on to the man named George who was found killed in his home. Barking was also heard during this attack for some reason. The body was so fucked up that it was hard to identify him. George's face had been cut off, he was stabbed 487 times, four of these wounds were fucked, and photos were found inside of his body. George's murder is, of course, what skinned George from pigs. A police dispatcher named- Can I just say that the four of these wounds were fucked? Like- It's like they're just sexualizing it, like, just like, how can we make this even, even crazier and grosser yeah. and more vile? Yeah, it, it just leads to that. More shock! More! This is like yeah. the Michael Bay of fucking shock horror. Yeah, it literally is. Like, it's just over the top to the point where it's, like, it's just gross. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's not horror, in my opinion. It's horrifying. It's terrible to watch and listen. Sarah and her husband, Michael, got abducted, too. A security camera captured the killers entering Sarah's home, and this is the first time we get to see video from, well, from security camera footage. I mean, we get, like, actual, like, film, but this is the first, like, actual, like, animated video. And that's it for the series thus far. There are going to be more episodes, and the series is not... Finished. That's God, another I, issue I have right there. Fucking hope not, but yeah. <laughs> right? Like, this is CCTV footage. Of an animated That's person? Animated. Yeah. So, like, like it's, it, it'd be one thing if they, like, found, like, a little demo reel or whatever. Yeah. Because, like, Wendigoon goes over it, like, you know, some well, of the creepy stuff is, like, these, these arts. It's like, this is what they perceive them. It's like a the series. representation of their re of their form of what how they're vi viewed, but this is security camera footage. Yeah, and like it's... you could sit there and say, okay, and this is where I think it would play better to do this as not a police investigation, not not something tied to a reality that hard. You could sit there and say, well, um, if it's tied to like a Facebook, 4chan, whatever type of investigation, a social media investigation, you could say, well, uh, such and such, you know. Uh, went and actually was able to view some footage at the police department, but they did not allow him to leave with it. So we're recreating the footage that he saw based off of his memory like, to an animator. Yeah, and, th know? and that would make more sense, right? Yeah. Like, you're claiming it's actual CCTV footage, so like you live in this world that's animated. Yes. And it pulls you out of the reality of it. Like, yeah, it just... and it's comical. Because it, it, it's like, this is so bad. This is yeah. so bad. You can tell that the storytelling and like the lore and stuff took a major backseat to look at my art. Yeah. And it, to the point where it, like, actually I think it does the opposite where it cheapens your art. It at does. This point. It does. I mean, first of all, the art, it, I don't think it's that great anyway. And I don't give a shit. Like if I'm hurting somebody's feelings by saying that, um, <laughs> if you're going to portray it in this way, do better art. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're going to tell me, look at your art, at least have it be good art. Not this cheap shit that I probably could with, uh, relative ease, probably find an AI art generation tool and make something similar. Yeah, well, I mean, no my, my profile picture's art, and it looks similar. Yeah. And my picture yeah, is AI. I, I think your picture looks better. Yeah, and mine's AI. I yeah. literally just put, I literally went through and put, like, Victorian Slenderman, and that's what it popped out. I'm like, okay, that's, that's me now. Yeah, like, like when, when I saw this, I was like, this looks like a weird art amalgamation of, like, Greylock and Smile Tapes and, like, uh, 
Mandela catalog. It's like taking and cherry picking, but then combining it into the worst thing you could possibly make. Yeah, it reminds me of like things like like in video game development we see in a lot, right? Yeah. Where like you take concepts that other people have done and then you soullessly sort of collect them together because that's what you think. Right? Like, oh, people like open worlds. We're going to throw that in here. Oh, people like collectibles. We're going to throw that in here. People like female characters. Well, we're going to have an all-female cast. Yeah. And then it, to the point, like, it gets to be like this, like, almost like amalgam of just popular ideas without knowing what made them popular. It's stuff. The analog horror series. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like what made, you don't get what made Greylock good. You don't yeah. get what made smile tapes you know uh marble hornets like all of these other things good yeah you just saw that and you replicated it but you don't know why it worked yeah and it was the storytelling that went with it like and cool like you could do the art with this that you did if you had a better writer yeah like the storytelling we got is literally what i would scribble up as a rough outline like this is what happened in the episode, and then you go back and be like, "All right, well, here's the plot point." Like it's like he's giving plot points, but then he's not refining them into an actual story. He's just doing plot points. Yeah. A, B, C happened, and then we found art. Yeah. And it's like, and it's not even it's not even like in a logical manner. That's the other thing that bothers me. Like there has to be some some logic to this, in my opinion. Like there's five seven paintings found sometimes, and it, these events happened within like a short relative time frame. Like, there's, there's no way that... Like, what is he doing, the art of these people ahead of time and then making sure they die looking like that? Like, there's even, like, there's other things that are stupid that just, like, it's a stupid thing that bothers me. Like, the hand... or They were found handcuffed to the pole with their arms ripped off. Well, then how are they handcuffed to the pole? Like, if that's just... That's just, like... Arms are ripped off. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, it's, like, that level of thought, right? Yeah, like, it's, like, you literally gave no thought to how this was going to play out, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, like... like like, like what's really creepy? People like animals. That's hurt animals. People hate when people rape children. Let's do that. Yeah. Oh man. Just thus far, there are going to be more episodes, and the series is not finished yet, so I can't review it as if it's a whole. Oh, yeah. So far, the series does deserve its negative reputation. It's all just like shock value for the sake of shock value, and I really can't respect that. The lack of storytelling leaves a dry taste in my mouth that I wish could be resolved. I'm no Nostradamus at storytelling, but I'm also not making a horror series to a dedicated 90,000 subscribers. The story peaked in its shock value with Buck Toy Cory, since he was not only a child, but was also mutilated and raped, judging by the title. The only reason I don't find Four Whole Fiona more shocking is that there's no implied sexual assault. I'm not ruling it out, but at least Four Whole Fiona gives some ambiguity. This series' shock value problem transcends Fuck Toy Cory, though. In the case of George and his 400 stab wounds, four of which being fucked, and his cat being skinned and fucked, as well as Hall being forced to eat his own unborn daughter, or even the case of May being fucked to death by a horse, you know, these are all examples of this aspect. If the series was more grounded and focused on the police investigation or included more live elements such as the phone call or security footage, I could see this series actually being good. It's such a shame because the idea of a serial killer that makes paintings of his victims and leaves them around is such a good premise that it's so utterly botched in its execution. I only talked about all these episodes as opposed to just the most shocking ones to show how repetitive the series gets. A criticism I see of Urban Spook critics is that they don't look at the whole series, which, to their credit, the only big, all the big critique videos I've ever seen really only talk in-depth about In the Walls and Pigs, and I've talked about everything to ensure you're not missing anything special by only watching those two. I watched the whole series hoping to change my mind, but fundamentally it's the same every episode. In case you haven't noticed a pattern, every episode throws you into the deep about a recently abducted or missing person, and then goes into painstaking amount of detail describing the conditions in which, uh, not said missing people die because sometimes we just cut to completely different people, which gets really confusing sometimes. Uh, then we get paintings of them. Sometimes we get a painting in advance and have to put it together ourselves, which makes for an interesting puzzle, and I kind of like doing that. You know, if you notice the lack of analysis, that would be because there's not much to analyze. Everything is given to you, and every mystery that comes up is solved like an episode later. There's no, like, connecting puzzles that lead you to find, like, cool Easter eggs or anything like that. It's all just kind of given to you. There's no, there's nothing left up to guesswork. Someone who likes to analyze the stuff they watch isn't going to get a lot from this series. Uh, the most interesting activity you have is putting the painting to the name, but, you know, that's, that's pretty easy, honestly. I know this is not a super, like, uncommon take, but one thing I actually need to give him credit on is the fact that he makes all the paintings himself and he makes all the music he uses in his series himself. As someone who dabbles in all of that stuff, it takes, you know, it takes a lot of effort to do some shit like that. And that's why I find it so disappointing that the story that ties it all together is so lackluster. Because everything else, the music, the paintings, you know, the, the art, all of it is pretty damn good. You know, like, look at the look at the pig painting. Like, that shit's unsettling as fuck. 
but then you look at the story that ties it all together and it all kind of ruins it. If you made like a good story to tie everything together, this would be pretty epic, but we can't live in that reality, I guess. In the beginning of this video, I said that the creator of this series is oddly defensive of the stuff he's made, and I called that uh, defensiveness ambiguous. And that's because his story changes every single time he talks about it. The whole hate train started when a Twitter interaction happened, and I'm sure you already know this one. A tweeter said, what's an analog slash digital horror opinion that'll get you like this? A YouTuber named Pastor replied saying, we need to stop praising series that rely entirely on shock value to carry their horror. Stuff like Urban Spook drives me nuts, because the only horror it has relies entirely on trying to describe the most vile possible thing with little else. And he is right! He is 100% right! <laughs> This guy nailed it on the fucking head. And you know what? He shouldn't be like that because of this opinion, because as you can see, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. You can tell every spook has talent is just too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's the thing, too, if you just put the effort into the storytelling. Yeah, and I mean, like, God, you know, there's, again, it goes back to, like, when we were talking about the horror thing. There's a lot to be said about leaving something to the imagination. Like, if you had sat there and said, for instance, and I'm not saying I'm a great storyteller, but like, okay, police have been finding bodies, and these bodies are so beyond morally mutated that police have actually retired from the force, they're grotesque, they've had to seek therapy, they're just ungodly damaged with PTSD for life because of what they're seeing, and the newspapers are not even allowed to report on this because of how horrific this stuff is, and we need to try and figure out what's going on here, who is this person, what are they doing, like, that leads more to the mind. And like, okay, what would be so horrific that it would force policemen to retire? What would be so horrific that they're getting PTSD? You know, like, yeah. And it says nothing about the gore. Yeah, like, and that and that lends with what uh, Wendigun would say, like about like why like he finds like some of those like QC stuff terrifying because it leaves the picture of this is how he sees it. So if this is how he sees what beauty is, what is actually there? It adds that chilling level of like horror where it's like. Yeah, I mean, even the great one, Pet Scop. Think yeah. about Pet Scop. There's absolutely no gore in Pet Scop. There isn't any. It's just like a morbid sense of there's something not right here. There's just something's wrong. And like, you don't know what it is. And so you come back to try and find it. Like, what's the next clue to maybe help me get down the track? Yeah, I, I think it would have been much more tastefully done rather than just the going to the over the top thing, right? It would be hilarious. Like, and I'm not saying I'm skilled enough to do this. It would be funny to take all of his stuff and redo Urban Spook but make it good. Well, that's what people were hoping you would do after, like, the Wendigoon video, right? It's like, you got <laughs> Crow and Wendigoon giving you basically, like, hey, these are the good things about your stuff. Just tighten up your story a little bit. Like, you know, and, and re-release it. Like, remaster it. I mean, it's not like he... Back then, before he became a, a dick and treated everyone badly, he could have saved it, right? Yeah. yeah. And now, like, he's just fled the internet. Like, uh, that's what it looks like. I, I mean, you pumped out so many of these things, you're telling me, with, I'm sorry, with the level of work that you're putting into this, it doesn't take you that long to make the next set of series. Yeah. I think he's gone. I think this is a dead horror series, and I hope to God I'm right. Yeah. I'd like to see him come back maybe a year from now with it remastered, with, like, actual, like, well-produced, well-acted stuff, but I, I don't think, he doesn't come across the type that learned from it after you delve deeper into how he acts behind the scenes. Well, if there's some budding horror fanatic out there, seriously, and you want, like, you're maybe not a good story writer, take take this and just make it better. Take everything you know about horror and make it better. Like, watch actual stuff, watch what makes it scary, or what you think makes it scary, and you can do it. Like, we've given so many examples, like, you could literally just steal this guy's stuff, fuck the art, the art's awful anyway, Make new art. <laughs> you really don't like your art. Like, you lean so into the whole, like, this is dog shit, and hope he kills himself. I'm like, oh, wow, Patrick, that's a little extreme. You know what? Nobody liked Van Gogh's art until he killed himself. <laughs> oh. I, don't, I don't know how to say. Like, I want to say you're wrong, but at the same point, like, you do you, and no, but, yeah. like, Teddy's right here. Teddy is 100% right. Like, what sucks is uh, what this YouTube video said. The general plot seems cool. It does. It can be cool. It can be. Just scale back the shock, fix the art, and maybe get some better story writing. Yeah. yeah and if there's <laughs> anyone that, like, wants to, like, actually, like, make horror, my biggest advice to you is what makes, what scares you, start with that. Yeah. And then expand out on it. 
you don't need a gimmick. Right? You don't no. need to be like gore. You don't need to be like you don't get gore from you don't get horror from gore. You don't get horror from jump scares. Right? Take what makes you afraid and why. Like you know, like I'll bring up pop culture. Right? Batman. Yeah. Thought bat were scary. So what did what happened with that? He like personified what scared him about bats the fact that they're always that you can't see them they're in the dark they're sort of lurking yeah and, and then he personified it yeah personified it and made the criminals afraid of bats yeah so just do that with whatever you're afraid of yeah like I, I, there's so much easy stuff there there's so much good stuff to pick from and like i i would say honestly go watch as many analog and air g and different horrors as you can and just figure out like okay what makes this cool to you yeah. Like, what makes this a good horror to you? And I bet you nine times out of ten, it's not going to be gore. Like, the more I've gotten into it, the more you realize that, like, um, like, okay, to give you an idea, like, I'm really, really, really big into cinematography. I love, I'm, I, I, I view myself to be a cinephile, okay? And in that, I will actually, like, I've gotten through enough movies now, especially horror movies. I'm at the point that I can actually sit there and tell you when jump scares are coming up. Because there's certain, like, effects that they all use. They're going to use a, a pre-shock of intensifying the music slightly and then dropping it and softening it. Or they'll just soften off slowly. And why? Because silence is scarier than what they're going to do. It's the abrupt abruptness out of silence is what scares you. So they have to make it as quiet as possible. So when you hear stuff like tapering down, it's getting quiet, nobody's talking, like these are all cues you can watch for and then, like, actions are slower. Typically, they'll draw out a process more. Somebody creeping through a house in the dark. And it's deathly quiet. And sometimes they'll do a big, a little pre-scare with a, and with a cat jumping off the counter. Or something like that. Or knocking something over. Like, and it's enough to startle you, but it's not enough to scare you. And then there's two different ways they'll typically go. They'll either do the whole lull sense of security thing with the, oh, it was nothing. Because your body's going to retain that tension for the seconds later when something is going to happen. Or... They'll escalate it. And that's where you get, like, the big boom in music, the big sounds, like, all of it. Like, it's just, there's ways to scare people. And, like, I've been able to tell that now. Like, Terrifier franchise. It's gory as shit. Yep. Shocking. But what I like about it is the actor's performance. Yeah. Yeah, if all the gore was gone, Terrifier would still have a horror to it just because of the clown. And the, his acting ability and the creepy smile and stuff like that that aren't even, like, the actions and the gestures and the mimicking and the, the, the clown part of him is creepy and unnerving. But, like, th basically what he's done here with shock and gore is kind of a jump scare. I mean, like, and it's so repetitive. It's so rinse and repeat that from story one to story six, you can't even tell the difference. There's no change. You know nothing additional that you took away from this series from story one to story six. Like, no, it, it's all just a string of inappropriate murders. Yeah. That's that's it. That's like, ooh, scary. This this kid was violated. This animal was beaten. This happened. That happened. Well, and You're you real have, scared now, right? Like, and, and again, even with like the killer, you have in the first part. In the first part, you have here's a painting of the killer, and then it's here's video footage of the killer, and then at the end, it's here's video footage of the killer. Like here's a CCTV still. Here's a painting of him. Here's a picture of him, and here's a video of him. That's four out of six episodes right there. Nothing yeah. changed. You never learned any more other about this additional killer. That storyline just fucking died. That just completely fucking died. Oh, there's two of them. That's why there was a two painted on the wall. And then you kind of get it at the end with the video footage. That's it. Yeah, like, and like I said, like the whole like it, it, it's it, it feels like too. It's like it's it has to be blatant because it's not written in a way that you could solve it yourself. So yeah. it's like, that's why you had to add the two. Well, if you spent more time, like I said, like, you know, maybe one did photography and the other did paintings, like oil paintings, you know, you could, you could get us there, right? Yeah. But you have to, you have to try. Like, you gotta, you gotta get us there though. Like, yeah, I just like, there are so many different things you could do. The paranormal thing, like we talked about, uh, you know, there's uh, the, you could do the Facebook stuff with the not real investigators. So that's why it's kind of botched and weird. And that would excuse even some of your, your story writing, too. So if you're putting it on the general public is doing this kind of shit, it's going to be botched-ish. I mean, look at what happened with the Don't Fuck With Cats. Like, watch that. Like, they botched yeah. shit with that. And ultimately, did they figure out who uh, Luca Bignano was? Yes. But, like, it was a botched fucking investigation. Yeah, and, like, even now I'm getting ideas, right? Yeah. Like, how I would would have done it. Like... For example, like, tie it in with mythology, because I really like mythology. What happens if it was 
having an entire idea of like what if the gods were real but they got corrupted or something right so like you would have like apollo writing songs about murders he's committed you can have it like a like an art god right kind of like a monument mythos kind of almost yeah yeah like an art like a god of art that was corrupted and started killing people because he found beauty in death right and then he would paint his murders and that would add like a mythology thing it would add like the supernatural how they can just do things yeah you know what i mean because there's like a supernatural element because they're not human you know they have like this fantastical element to them it adds some ties to some like real world mythology and you could like corrupt that and twist that right like yeah yeah. oh man all right let's finish this off before i get into my narrative which i would say is a pretty accurate summation of what we've talked about thus far but urban spook didn't take too kindly to this he replied to this saying you're such a fucking pussy. Just because extreme horror doesn't fit into your little autistic furry horror taste doesn't mean that there isn't a place for it. Use your platform to talk about things you like instead of shitting on actual creators, cunt. Not the, it's not the most civilized response I've, I've ever seen, but, you know, all, all things considered, it could have gone a lot worse. And this response was uh, yeah, an optics nightmare for him. At this point, a lot of people in the analog horror community found him to be a piece of shit who doesn't really make great content, which, you know, I have my reservations about calling it all that, as you've heard, but... Yeah, I I can't help but agree because of how defensive he's being here. In a Reddit thread talking about this Twitter exchange, Urban Spook actually replied saying, Pastor is a rat. This isn't the first time he talks shit. Maybe I went a little hard. I don't know. I'm sure you're aware that there's been an extreme amount of hate lately. I guess this kinda was the last straw for me. This isn't the first fairly big content creator that basically says I shouldn't have a place in the community simply because I do extreme horror. As I've said it before, I'll keep calling this series analog horror for its consistency. There's a part of me that wants to know if Slug is actually Urban Slug and he's upset at me because of that. <laughs> but as soon as it's done, I'm drawing myself away from the analog horror community. I'll keep making horror content on the channel, though. I really try to focus on all you guys who support my work instead. But it's hard sometimes, especially since I'm fairly new to this. So please know that I appreciate you all so much. And here we have it. He was under a lot of pressure at the time, and therefore he snapped when he really shouldn't have. Whether he regrets it or not is kind of in the air. But as you can see, this is very clearly not something he'd ever do. Uh, This is just an isolated incident because everything's been stacking up so much, despite the fact that he really hadn't been getting that much hate at this point. But you know, any amount of hate can be a lot to someone who's just starting out making content who's not used to all the attention. But here we have here where he's kind of molding about the hate he's been getting. Urban spook haters when horror is meant to be horrifying. And it's just a picture of Fucktoy Cory. Or, or, or here, where we have someone who doesn't really like Urban Spook just posting a picture of someone saying, why does everyone hate this analog horror series? Just with the, with the very crass reply, because it's dog shit. And Urban Spook just replies saying, hey, you're a furry. I don't even know if I'd say that this OP is a furry. I mean, they've got an animal in their profile picture, but that's very clearly a animatronic character from the Walton Files. They might just be a Walton Files fan, you know? But I guess animal and picture equal furry equal degenerate. I, we're still stuck in 2016, I guess. I have no clue the context behind what he's even saying here with Chez who. But someone, you know, I assume Chez, says, no idea, man. Stay spooky. Clearly trying to be like a good sport about uh, being basically called irrelevant by Urban Spook here. And Urban Spook can't even stay a good sport. He just says, lol, ain't no fucking way. This is some horror project. I thought this was just another autistic kid with his persona as BFP Lamau. But, you know, really going out of his way to make everyone hate him. Like, like this guy's trying to be nice to you and you're, just, and you're just doing this shit. It's like, there's a, there's a reason no one respects this guy. And behavior like this is how you could just end up even more hated. Like, you don't make your series good. You do all the shit yourself, which lends you some props, but because you do that, you feel entitled to just talk shit about everybody who has a problem with the lack of story writing that is Fuck Toy Cory. Like, you know, anyone could come up with Fuck Toy Cory in their head. Could anyone come up with... Well, I'm sure a lot of people could come up with The Walton Files, actually. It's a pretty basic story. But The Walton Files, at least, is good. For how derivative The Walton Files is, it's actually good. But here we have the last thing I want to talk about, and that's Urban Spook's comment under the Wendigoon video, where he basically does nothing but lambast the Urban Spook series. Where he says, Wow, I can't wrap my head around the fact that you actually made a video talking about something I created. Even if it's not necessarily in a good light, it's still surreal to me since I've watched your content for some time. Here's some things I really want to clarify. I have no idea where you've heard that I don't care about my series or that I only make it to sell shirts. Because you can literally tell, watching what you're doing, that you don't give a shit about horror. And the fact that, like, the Chaz Kids thing, like, you didn't know who that was, tells me you don't know anything. Yeah. Like, just lends credence to that Wendigoon thing where it's like, yep, nope, this is about marketing. Yep. That's not true. 
I made the first couple episodes just for fun, but since it blew up, I really want to improve and try my hand at something new for each episode, like animation or voice acting. I age-restricted myself for episode 6, since this was around the time I realized there's a lot of kids watching my series. The painter was intended for an 18-plus audience. I had no idea that so many young people in the community were watching when I started. Also, the episode was planned out way before any controversy started. It was not a response to angry people on Twitter. Speaking of, please don't take anything I do on Twitter seriously. A lot of people know me solely from Twitter by now, but I really only use that site to troll. I don't really care if anyone hates my work. I'm very aware that it's extreme and provocative. I get the criticism about the writing being shit. Or by the way, the whole the whole cope of like, don't take it serious. My my Twitter's only for fucking trolling. It doesn't sound like you're trolling there. It sounds like you're coping. It sounds like it reminds me of the Wojak. Yeah. Like. <laughs> and music are things I've done my whole life, and they're what I mainly want to put out there with the series. I've never done writing before, and telling a story with deep lore, etc., was never the point. However, there's definitely more to it. There's a bunch of hidden things in the episodes, from one-frame puzzles to clues in the audio design. I even think there's stuff people still haven't found. Seeing the community come together to figure out the name of the painter was really cool. There's more there, even if it's not that deep. And while the presentation is a bit janky, mostly because English isn't my first language, it's one of my favorite aspects of the series. Again, you don't have to do a, ser a series in English. Okay, uh, uh, what's it? The... Is it the Smile Tapes? No, there was another one. Wasn't it only in, like, uh, Russian or something? And, like, some Russian person translated it to English? Like, just yeah. so that uh, it could actually be open to a wider audience? Like, there's been a couple, like, uh, Ukrainian, um, Spanish, like, I can think of a couple different languages that horror has been done in. If it's good, the community will take care of helping you translate it. Yeah, your fans will be your biggest asset. They will help you. Yeah. You just got to give them a reason to want to. Yeah. Right? Like, I, you just got to treat them with respect. I don't care what language this was in. It would suck. Mainly because here. Yeah. But it would suck. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, this is one of those things that you could easily, easily close caption it in a different language. Yeah. You could offer a fucking transcription. I mean, like, you could even transcribe, even if it's shittily done, into other languages. Like, if you wanted to just automatically appeal to a larger, larger audience, you could just use free services. Like, okay, it's not going to be that askew. If you translated it to English, you could even send it to somebody and be like, can you read through this transcript? Does this make sense? It's, yeah. not, like your, it's not like your videos are earth-shatteringly long, either. Uh, did I leave it up? Six minutes, seven and a half minutes is the longest video. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, know... You can turn I'm, the script off. I know from running stuff through AI, this is about about uh 5000 characters or no sorry 3000 characters so basically a minute is a thousand characters and like i i'm not even saying words characters so this is a 7200 character script that spaces and everything like it, it's not going to take long to like even if you got to chunk it out run that through ai to translate it and you could even like if you've got things that don't make sense you could then just ask like a friend or someone to be like hey what's the better word here yeah yeah i mean it, there's so many there's so many, many ways to do yeah. this, you know, yeah. and that's that literally is what it, what it boils down to. Like, if he would have ended it with that, then I think it would have been fine. Like, yeah, I know I'm new to this space. I'm trying to create it. I really actually like it. A lot of people would be more forgiving, but it's like the whole like, oh, you the must be a furry. It's, yeah. It's yeah. the attitude. Yeah. You know, it's like and that rubs people the wrong way. And then, you know, that's essentially what really turned me off to like wanting him to have his redemption art. Right. Is like, yeah, you don't even get it. Like, you don't get it. Like, it's just you as a person don't get it. If I ever made a remaster of the series, I would keep all the spelling mistakes in. I like the camp. Lastly, hearing you say that I have talent made me really happy. Like I said, I've been enjoying your content for some time, and I hope I can create something that you can also enjoy in the future. Rob is a great guy, and I'm so glad to see his project grow. In fact, it might be the first analog horror series I decide to watch, thanks to how you talk about it. That sentence is so telling to me. Right, it, might like be the first, it might be the first analog horror series that I decide to watch. So you yeah. jumped into a space... That you literally know nothing about. Yeah. Ironically, some that links in with a topic coming up. <laughs> Rob is the guy who made Greylock, the uh, the actually good analog actually horror good. series from <laughs> Wendigoon's video. Well, not from Wendigoon's video. Wendigoon didn't just like spawn the series, but it's the other analog horror video he talked about in in the video. And you know, it, it, you could actually be fooled by this YouTube comment all you want. I mean, if you want to believe that he is 100% just trolling on Twitter and he doesn't believe anything he says on there, well, I mean, I guess that's cool with you. I mean, the way he talks on there is certainly like he's trying to get a rise from people. But that Reddit comment he made in his own subreddit, he hasn't mentioned using Reddit to troll, and he seems pretty genuine on his Reddit. And so, him saying that the pastor interaction was actually how he felt at the time, and how maybe he shouldn't have gone so hard, that implies that that actually is what he was thinking, and that he wasn't trolling. 
And so that's why I genuinely think that he actually is super defensive of this slot. He'll put on a character and say that he's actually just trolling, but it actually just gives him free reign to mold in people's comments. And it's honestly understandable because he does put a lot of effort into the series, and so I wouldn't be surprised that he's super defensive of the stuff he makes. I hope he can actually, like, acknowledge that the writing in his series isn't good. Part of me doesn't think he actually believes it because he doesn't seem to be making an effort, even in his later episodes, to improve upon that. He's improved the means by which the art is made by adding different things such as the uh, such as the dispatcher call or the animation at the end of episode 8, but the writing hasn't changed at all. And he doesn't seem to be making effort towards improving that even though he says that he is trying to get better at everything. But I just don't think that what he's saying is entirely genuine. I know Wendigoon pinned it because he's just such a good-natured guy that he finds it impossible to like be mean to anyone even if they kind of deserve to be put in their place. I don't believe he is a, entirely a troll. I think the way he acts makes him come off as a troll, but that's just because of how he is. And I think he knows that and he's taking advantage of it to make people think that he's not being genuine when he actually is. I'd show you even more incidents of him acting like this troll persona, but this video would be way too long and you've already gotten the point of how he is online. You know, do you think he's a troll? Do you think he's just a real moldy guy who knows that he can easily come off as a troll? You know, let, let me know about this. What do you make of this whole situation? I hope you at least know now that this has been Urban Spook, the worst YouTube horror series that I think I've ever seen. All right, so, anything you want to add to that? I mean, that, there's not much more other than what we already talked about, right? Like, yeah. it, that's the biggest issue that I have, right? Is like, the crassness, the over-reliance on the gore, and just overall, like, it, it, it's the lack of focus on a coherent story, and then, like, the whole, oh, yeah, no, totally, like, I don't, I don't, you know, know what's going on and, uh, and all of that other stuff, and I'm new to this space, la da 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 Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. I, I don't, it, it's like, well, then, you, you can't enter a space, like you said, without knowing the rules of that space. And that's actually, that links up with the Conjuring House that we're actually going to talk about, I think, next, right? Yep, yep, that about is our next thing. <laughs> about how Jacqueline Nunez entered the paranormal space without knowing a single thing about the paranormal community and all that other stuff. Are you stuff. kidding? She's had 40-something years of experience. It's funny because that's not what she told, <laughs> told Satori. She literally told Satori that she didn't have I any... Know, I know. Yeah, I've because... seen that. I've seen that interview too. And it's like, okay, so which is it? <laughs> well, yeah, because there's a, also another channel that I watched actually interviewed Satori over Instagram and she re claimed the same thing again. That like, she had no idea what she was doing when she entered the community, but she was intrigued by it and wanted to get involved. It's like, th that's not how you do it though. Oh, I don't, you know, you want to get into the paranormal community? Don't go out and buy a house. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you want to get into like, you know, analog horror? Don't just start making a random yeah. shock jock fucking like series watch it talk to people yeah. go to the subreddit see what makes people tag show your interest and be like hey this is my art do you think this would be a good idea bounce it off of people it's not an arg right like yeah. that's the biggest thing people like args i understand it from an arg because you don't want to give away your puzzles because that's half the experience this isn't an arg well that's All the thing you is he tries to pull the cope it. like it is at the end and it's like well, well there's well, stuff in the audio and there's one picture puzzles and stuff like that and it's like so you made an ARG, which is an extrapolated analog horror. Let's not kid ourselves. Like, you have to at least be able to probably do an analog horror in order to do a ARG because you're you're going above that now. So your storytelling yeah. and everything has to carry itself real easy and real natural to blend the other stuff into it. Well, yeah, and that's actually like if you um uh look over uh Marble Hornets. Yeah. Jay goes over it. Whereas like yeah um there was actually one part of the thing where i wrote the cipher wrong so nobody could solve the puzzle yeah so we just had to so he had to upload just on to the arc that yeah. that oh no the arc found the arc solved it here it is yeah because like we messed up on it so you need to have infinitely more levels yeah and understanding of what you're doing on a deeper level than just telling the story then and you can't even nail the basics it's like you can't bake but now you're starting your journey making a quiche yeah no, start with cookies. Work your way up to the <laughs> difficult stuff, right? Because quiches are temperamental as, as shit. Yeah. Like, you do the wrong thing, the quiche burns, right? Don't start with a quiche. Start with cookies. Start with something easy, simple. Expound on that. It's it's funny that you picked quiche, too, because I despise quiche. <laughs> yeah, well, I just, I just remembered because uh, of, fucking, like, my... It's an egg bake. Get over yourself. <laughs> right? Well, no, because, like, you were, um... 
you talked about that one time when my profile picture, you're like, it's very Whovian. And yeah. ever since you said that, I just kept picturing Clara baking the quiche. <laughs> again and again and again. And how difficult she said it was to learn. And then like, I, I'm going to use this one day. And then like a week later, <laughs> I, I, I could fit the quiche in. And I am you know what artistically it, excited about that. You know what it reminded me of? And it actually fit well into it and what your, your profile picture reminded me of. Um, it reminded me of the silence. I was about to say that, yeah, with the way that the face looks. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, if you don't know Doctor Who and you don't know who the Silence are, it's one of the better storylines in Doctor Who. Like, ongoing new character storylines, because there's the Daleks, and there's a bunch of, like, Cybermen and things like that that are, they go back in the lineage of the story. So, like, you could even sit there and say, like, they might not be great characters, but they're loved. And so they've been kind of grandfathered in because they've just been around so long. But, like, the Silence was a new character. And... It actually was probably one of the scarier characters in that series. And yeah, it's just because it's scarier than the angels, the weeping angels were yeah. not as scary as the silence because the angels really didn't do much for the most part. But the funny thing I say with the angels is you, is you basically, they live you to death. Like they yeah. literally, they live you to death. They just, the angels, the weeping angels with those series is they, if they catch you, they don't harm you. They just transport you to a different time and feed off of your energy of the life that you would have lived now. They're basically time vampires. Kind of, in a way, yeah. With the silence, they were the creepiest thing because, like, you would look at them and you would see this monster and it's scary, but the second you looked away, you forgot everything about them. Yeah, it, it, it's very, like, it was a very SCP-like, right? Yeah, like, like yeah. the statue, like, oh, I think it's 043, the statue that snaps your neck if you're not looking at it. Like, that's why, why it was so compelling because it, it feeds into that recess of your mind, like, I'm uncomfortable, but why? And it's like this deep-seated, like, you were uncomfortable by the silence, but your memory was wiped, but your instinct just felt like something was wrong. Yeah. 